Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturring in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a fun idea episode where we're going to be talking about the future of digital asset optimization. And to help us walk through this conversation, we have Andrew Hastert, who is the Director of Channel Partnerships at Rockwell Automation. So welcome, Andrew. Hey, thanks, Chris. I'm excited to be on your show. Hey, we're excited to have you. We really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Looking forward to this conversation. And when you hear the, the term digital asset optimization, for our listeners that may be new to this topic, can you break that down for them? Sure. You know, a manufacturing facility is a collection of assets that in goes raw material and out goes a finished good. I think we all know that. What's changing and why this is so important right now is that machine on its own is not very valuable to a plant. The machine requires humans to go and operate those machines and optimize how they operate and what comes out of the machine. So there's a digital aspect of that and a human aspect of that. And what's changing is the human piece. Pandemic has only accelerated the challenges that industrial facilities have had relative to generational workforce gap and workforce turnover. And out is walking a generation of knowledge from the plant that knows how to make those machines run and how to optimize them. And that's where digital comes in. I, I, we're seeing companies more and more invest in digitizing their assets so that they understand what they are, how they work, how to optimize them, so that as three people retire and one step in, that one stepping in can on day one get to know how to run that equipment and optimize it. There's more to it than that, but I'd say generally asset optimization is all about digitizing the assets such that new people can step in and make it work and make it excel. Right. And I know, Andrew, we've heard a lot of through our episodes and recordings, we're hearing about just what you're saying, that retiring workforce and that that knowledge is leaving these plants. And then that ramp up time to get the new employees up to speed is getting longer and longer sometimes. But with this approach, you're taking it back the other direction, right? That's right. And I think it's a direction that we've been headed in for a long time. The pandemic has taken that trend line and, and ripped it and fast forwarded in 10 years and pasted it back together. So we've seen this step change of companies having to digitize their assets to get new types of value out of it because there's frankly less people that are able to go work in the plants. And unfortunately, it's a more dynamic workforce. You know, you've got people that get sick and infect others and suddenly you need to quickly get new workers into the environment. Or you, you need to space them out more. The nature of manufacturing has shifted pretty rapidly, and, and that trend towards digitization of assets has accelerated very quickly. No doubt. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's challenging all of us to think differently. And, you know, if there's some technology out there, Andrew, that you're seeing companies jump on or, or try to learn more about right now immediately to make the biggest impact, what would those be? Well, it starts with the assets themselves. Once upon a time, you go into a manufacturing facility and, and the asset was a machine or a line or uh, a small skid. And those machines are more and more getting connected to themselves with the devices on those machines. There's input devices, there's logic, there's output. The devices themselves now have a digital capability. They, they have an IP address they can connect to each other. They can connect to a central system in the plant. They can connect to the business system. So the first stage of technology is just digitizing the assets themselves with the devices on the equipment. The next stage is applying some sort of software environment such that you can capture those assets and uh, monitor them. You can characterize them, and you can support them long term. And then there's, of course, the cloud which is getting the data out of the plant and based on your contextualization of those assets. And if you get it into the cloud, you can get a whole lot of data into the cloud and you can then apply things like AI and ML and remote managed services 
to get more value out of that data once you've contextualized it and pulled it out. And you've got a couple of things compounding this neat opportunity. One, there's more connected devices than ever before. We believe there's somewhere over 3 billion devices in the industrial sector that have the ability to get connected. And then you've got those devices creating more data than ever before. You remember old computers had megabytes or maybe gigabytes of storage space. The cloud has terabytes and petabytes of storage capacity. And these devices suddenly are creating terabytes a day of data. So now that you've got more devices and more data, there's that middle piece of contextualizing the data that becomes critical to getting value out of it. Right. Absolutely. Great points here. I like the three points that you put out just to recap for our listeners. So basically you you have a lot of these digital type devices now that you need to apply the software to so that you can actually capture and monitor what's going on at the device level. But then you mentioned AI and ML. Can you explain that for our listeners, what you're talking about there? Yeah. So AI and ML are really just mathematical means of taking data and coming up with new conclusions. And AI and ML happen to use you know, advanced algorithms and new types of math to come to those conclusions. They also happen to be good at parsing large sets of data and either making context where there is none or based on past events, finding when future events are going to occur. And so now if we were to talk about some of the types of value companies are getting out of their data from their digital assets, an example is predictive maintenance, right? If, if you can notice when a uh, machine failed in the past, it, you've got a bunch of inputs and terabytes of data associated with a past failure event. Machine learning is really good at watching those same inputs and predicting before it happens, when it's going to happen again. And, you know, some examples included like vibration monitoring on a, on a motor. Just by seeing a certain vibration profile, you can, with ML, see when a motor or maybe the mechanical system it's attached to is going to fail in the future. Another example, and this is probably more of a new trend than an existing one today, using data to detect anomalies well before they occur. And, And a new use case is cybersecurity. It just imagine seeing all the data sets in a plant floor and the business system it connects to uh, identify anomalies that suggest somebody's intruded the plant or gotten uh, unique access from the data from the plant. You could detect that as a cybersecurity anomaly and challenge the IT function to go and hone in on that issue. We, we are actually helping companies today solve that, what we call anomaly detection problem, so that we can stop a cybersecurity incident well before it proliferates across an enterprise. Right. I mean, that's such a big key right now because everything is connected, right? And so you're increasing that risk potentially in the plant. So taking a proactive approach for cybersecurity is is critical. And and I love the machine learning example that you gave from a predictive services standpoint for that vibe monitoring. That's a service I used to be heavily involved with here at ECO. And that technology has really evolved, hasn't it, over time, just going from the, the handheld data collectors that still have their purpose, but the continuous monitoring that the technology offers today has really has grown leaps and bounds, and to, to add that machine learning into it, the plants it just it's making them that much more reliable and safe and efficient and all these things. It's you know great great examples there. Are, are there any other services that you're aware of that manufacturers should start considering uh, if they want to to get ahead of the curve? You know, two other things to think about. So one would be cybersecurity, and, and another would be predictive maintenance. Uh, you know, a third would be maintenance optimization. And and what that looks like is once you've identified all the assets in the plant and you've compared that to your storeroom, you'll notice that you've got some gaps in critical inventory. You also usually have some excess critical inventory. You know, you've got those stash items that have stuck in the storeroom or stuck in your closet for years and that you don't need anymore. And then you'll find that you also have recurring reliability challenges with certain devices or certain machines. And if you can map those things together, what's installed, 
what's in the storeroom, where there's gaps, where there's excess inventory, and where you have recurring reliability issues, you will have an opportunity to optimize what's in store in the facility. And that could be, you know, to the tune of millions of dollars stored. And if just taking that down by 10%, you could reduce carrying costs by a lot of cash in a given year. Similarly, if you can reduce some of those recurring reliability issues just by understanding what's installed and where you're cycling products through the storeroom, there's, again, a, a major uptime uh, improvement opportunity. The fourth is around performance optimization. If, if you could imagine capturing all the assets and understanding how they're impacting productivity, a 1% improvement from a performance standpoint, suddenly becomes a really big number as you look at an enterprise. And we, we look at the 1% problem. If, if you're looking at a, a billion dollar manufacturing company, and, and just for comparison, Rockwell's a almost $7 billion manufacturing company. So you know, we're not that large relative to some of these bigger firms in, in the consumer packaged goods and life sciences space. A 1% improvement for a billion dollar company and things like cost of goods sold yield a $5.8 million cost improvement. Or if you improve asset utilization by 1%, a $1.7 million cost improvement. So you can see how that scales to a very large industrial company. These are very large impacts just by improving performance, by, again, understanding your assets and applying some information to improve on things like asset utilization and cost of goods sold. Very good. Well, thank you for that. Now, I'd like to walk back to the maintenance optimization piece there, because when you're talking about gaps versus, you know, the critical inventory and how to do that, I'd like to break this down for our industrial listeners that are out there. Okay, that's a, that sounds great, but where do I start? So is this starting with like an installed base evaluation where you're understanding what's on the plant floor versus what's in the storeroom and doing a gap analysis? Is it that simple to get started? I think that's a great idea. And I know ECO offers those services. Just going into the facility, evaluating what you have installed versus the storeroom and figuring out where you've got min and max gaps or inventory gaps, having ECO come in and do that is an amazing step one. It's going to reveal a roadmap where you can find other ways to get value out of the plant. Right. Now, say that's been done, and let's just say that, that the, the industrial manufacturer out there, they've done that IBE, and they want to take it to that next step of you know performance optimization that you're talking about. So can you give us a little more from a map standpoint, where, where should they go next? They got the IBE, they got the data there, they know where their gaps are. Is there any low-hanging fruit that they sh- should look at from a performance optimization standpoint to really jump forward? You know, I, I think... At that point, when a company is thinking about how do I scale the value I'm delivering or scale the results I'm achieving, I think it's important to pull together a diverse set of people to the table to ask what our biggest challenges are and what our biggest opportunities for performance improvement are. Because if you look at any given company and you look at the potential objectives they want to achieve around throughput improvement, OPEX cost reduction, asset valuation reduction, asset optimization. They, they, they may have goals around one, two, or, or three of those at any given time and challenges related to any of those at, the t- at any given time. I think it's important to get you know, folks like operations, IT, EHS, maintenance, engineering, and, and others to the table to ask what are our biggest challenges and what are our biggest opportunities for improvement. I, I, there's a lot of a lot of ways to attack that problem. I think it's smart to get a consulting firm in to help pull that team together and ask those critical questions. Because when you reveal your biggest opportunity for improvement, you can focus on it. Right. Now, from the manufacturer standpoint, I have somewhat of a related question here. The, who would be the typical owner or the champion of of a project like this or, or looking at that? Or is there a certain group within the plant that typically – you know, would be charged of, hey, we need to understand uh, you know, maintenance optimization, performance optimization. We want to get better. Is it a cross mix or is there typically, you know, one select group of people that, that typically lead these efforts? Most successful pursuits we see when, when a company is trying to tackle problems like this is when they get a multifunctional cross-discipline team because 
Usually, the investments required to address the challenges, as well as the rewards associated with those challenges, impact or involve a lot of different people, a lot of different groups. Generally speaking, and maybe historically speaking, we see operations, plant operations, leading these sorts of pursuits. But more and more, we're seeing that shift to these new digital and IT functions because it's the digitization of the assets of the plan infrastructure and even connecting people across the enterprise into the carpeted space of the company, into the plant's operations, is what's yielding all this new value. Especially right now, given we're in a pandemic, people really can't be on site in the plant, and not all people, right? You, you may have some critical essential workers in the plant, but you're going to have a bunch of folks that are outside the plant that want to plug in and provide value and access the information. Digitization has become a lot more important recently, and it's afforded an opportunity for that multidiscipline approach. But IT and digital teams seem to have a heavier hand in these uh, projects than uh, operations has in the past. No doubt. And I guess it's still... So there's a gap there. We've talked about this in the past too, about there's a language barrier sometimes between digital IT and operations. So how have you Mm -hmm. seen the best practices to bridge that barrier or or help operations explain to IT what the process, if you will, and, and vice versa? IT and OT has long been challenged to align and find common objectives and common language and common tools to solve problems. You know, Rockwell actually has a consulting practice and a partnership with other consultants. This is the number one reason we're pulled in is to bridge that gap between IT and OT and help the two teams come together with common objectives. So I think a consulting engagement is a good way to get alignment within the organization. But whether you have a consultant or your own internal team, ultimately it's most important to align the organization on some common objectives And then you can get a common approach to attacking those objectives. But I I think there's often things lost in translation between IT and OT. And there's also that struggle around budget, you know, who's going to get the money to spend to address these issues. But I think alignment around objectives and alignment around the approach to attack them is the best way to get uh, conflict reduced and maximize the uh, opportunity for improvement. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that alignment is key. You know, we have to all be working. Well, if we all understand the goals, where we're trying to achieve, you know, and bring everybody together and also listen, be let everyone be heard, let their points be made. So I, I kind of want to go back a little bit to where we started the conversation about, you know, there's a lot of challenges right in, in industry right now that's leading towards the importance of digital asset optimization because, you know, quite frankly, people are, are retiring. They're reaching that age. A lot of knowledge is leaving the plant. So how do you think this could be addressed from a talent and a culture standpoint? Talent is such a big issue, especially uh, since the pandemic started. Talent is a massive issue. And I think it's interesting. We've talked for a long time about how people and process and technology come together to deliver results for a company. You know, People can't be removed from that equation, and I think the pandemic has proven that out tenfold, right? Without people, companies are really struggling, unless they're digitally connecting people into the process. But I'd say talent is the biggest challenge. Every company is, I think, going to shift into becoming a human capital company, where the amount of talent it has in the organization, the level of engagement, and the level of development, and their, the company's ability to retain that talent is going to become its differentiator versus traditionally it's IP and technology that, that causes companies to be valued the way they are. I think talent and human capital is going to be more and more what guides companies' valuation and sustainability. There, there's not only the challenge around keeping people engaged in business right now. I think that's compounded by, at least in the industrial sector, this challenge around there are not being a lot of women and people of color that are able to get uh, recruited and, and retained in the sector. And this is not just an industrial issue. This is true for all segments. If you look in North America, despite there being you know 51% of the population female, only 10% of the top management positions of S&P 500 or Fortune 500 companies have women in, in top management positions. 
10% <laughs> of top management positions are held by women. Only 5% of the CEO roles are held by women. The people of color statistics aren't good either. And I think this issue has been compounded during this pandemic. I saw a study recently that said 88% of working moms were significantly more stressed than uh, before the pandemic, which is a, a bit of a surprise. You know, <laughs> one might say it, it, it's, it should be 100 given what we're all going through right now. It, and there's also a challenge around the ability for women and people of color to work remotely. There seems to be some disparate challenges for those groups. 20% of black employees and 16% of Latinx employees have the ability to work remotely, which means you know, a significant number of them are either out of work or uh, are, are very challenged to be able to stay employed given the large percentage of jobs that can't be worked remotely. The big challenge I think we have is relative to including and engaging women and people of color in our sector. I, I think it's a challenge as a, as a sector, every company in it has to agree to overcome. Yeah, I agree. I mean, are there any steps? We, we've talked a lot about this topic, particularly we just had finished the Women in Engineering series, and that that's out for, for our listeners. Hopefully, if they haven't heard that yet, they can go back and check that out. Because, Andrew, many of the women we, we spoke to address this directly and head on. You know, a lot of the, the statistics that you covered they went through as well. And then one lady mentioned how, you know, she went to a, a major manufacturer's event and just how out of place somewhat she felt because the, mm-hmm. the low number of women there. Right. So, I mean, having these conversations definitely helps, but you know, any ideas, what are you seeing from maybe some of the best companies out there that are, that are opening up their minds and changing some of the, the, the way their strategy to, to be more accepting with their culture and trying to, to shift their culture rather are you seeing any types of uh, behaviors or activities that, that you like? It, absolutely. And I, I'd say first hats off to you for in your Ask Why series, having a, a series dedicated to women in industry. I think that on its own is helping elevate women and, and the, elevate the issue associated with underrepresentation of women and people of color in industry. So, so hats off to you. I think you, you've got an awesome start at that. I would offer, you know, maybe I'd introspect with Rockwell, you used the word culture. I think we saw that this issue could not be solved with metrics and data alone. Um, we couldn't compliance our way or policy our way or, or train our way into this solution. We needed to address the culture head on. And I, I think what we acknowledge is, frankly, we had a, a white male culture because we have, like a lot of companies, white male in the dominant group from a representation standpoint, especially in the leadership ranks. And it was about 10 years ago, our senior leadership agreed we were going to go on a culture of inclusion journey. And we were going to get very intentional in making sure that the dominant group, these, these white men leaders, would personally take it on themselves to make sure that they build a culture and change the culture to be not only accepting, but celebrating people that are different, people that uh, not only are different with race and sex, but different in general. We needed a culture that celebrated people for the differences and also fostered an environment where women and people of color could get ahead, could get opportunities, could, could get into leadership roles. And we've, we've made progress in that front. I think we still have a long way to go, but we've, we've been making progress. We were awarded a few years ago by the Catalyst Organization for not <laughs> the, the end state of our journey, but rather our progress and our commitment to uh, making more advancements, especially for women in the workplace. But I, I think we still have a long way to go. Absolutely. I mean, well, hats off. I mean, you're a leader. You recognize the importance Rockwell does of making that a priority. And through that behavior, I mean, you're going to impact other companies. I mean, that's great. And I mean, just we had a couple of guests through the women series. They they mentioned small things like, you know, company social events, you know, not have them so custom tailored to, quite frankly, just male type events. Right. So, I mean, a lot of people think about from a sales standpoint, you, you go golfing or, you know, there may be, you know, ball games and things like that. Well, not everything like that is conducive for women and it doesn't really align well. And particularly if you have 
post work thing sometimes. It's hard to get childcare lined up and things like that. So they were they were encouraging companies to think, you know, think outside the box, think differently. What can you do for that inclusion to to really bring everyone together? So I mean, hats off to 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 you and, and Rockwell and, and for you know taking a lead here because this is a definitely an important topic. Thanks, Chris. I, I agree. And you know, I think there's a couple of areas we're concerned about right now, and one would be working moms or or working parents caring for somebody with disability. The pandemic has introduced unique challenges for for those folks. Uh, I, I think society and and sometimes culturally, you know, people place child care on the mom and the family unit, and it's causing a disproportionate disadvantage for them in the workplace right now. So that's something we're, we're worried about. Some things we've done to maybe address the unique challenges women face, a couple of years ago, some of our leaders started what was called a Women in the Field Employee Resource Group, and we've had a couple of large employee resource groups. But this one in particular addressed the unique challenges of women working close to our customers, having to travel, you know, having to, if you could imagine, nurse while visiting customer facilities, it's it's a big challenge set on its own. And uh, we also cr- created what was called a Women in the Field Allies Group. So this is for men who wanted to ally and advocate and, and support this Women in the Field Employee Resource Group. You'd be surprised by the number of men that raised their hand and said they wanted to get involved. And and the progress that we, we've made since is pretty neat. So we have a long way to go. And, and there's still um, a journey ahead, but I'm excited about the progress we've made. I am too. I mean, and I think this is important sidebar to our topic to address head on and talk. And I appreciate you, Andrew, being so truthful and honest for our listeners. I think it definitely resonates with many of them. And, you know, tying it back to digital asset optimization, you know, we're trying to, to create it so we're, where we can open these channels for people of any origin to come and work inside industry and feel, you know, feel needed to feel a part of a team. You know, so if somebody's out there listening, Andrew, and they want to to really invest in themselves and learning and education, where would you point them if they wanted to enter this industry around and, and get better at digital asset optimization? Yeah. If you're wanting to get started on this digital asset optimization topic, I think you want to start with somebody you trust helping you identify the assets you have installed. And somebody like Eco certainly can help with this, you know, either through an installed base evaluation or similar. If you're worried about cybersecurity, I, I know Eco has services around threat detection and risk assessments for cybersecurity. I think that'd be an important first step too. You'd be blown away by the number of old XP machines that are out of support and very vulnerable to cyber security threats. On that topic, by the way, I, I think your listeners have heard about not Petya. You may have even brought it up in a past episode, that large cybersecurity event that took down a bunch of industrial facilities a few years ago. They, they estimated there was a $10 billion impact with the not Petya event. It all started with, the corner of one company's operations and one little computer in Ukraine that got infected and it spread across the entire enterprise for a bunch of large companies to knock them out from production for months or in some cases weeks, but in many cases months. I, I, I think identifying the assets so that you can understand the risk associated with them is step one. And I, I would start with calling Eco to get you started in that journey. Very good. Andrew, this has been a a, a fun conversation full of insight and wisdom for our listeners. And we always try to wrap the uh, eco S Y up with the why we get to that, to that purpose, that passion. So if you're an industrial uh, end user out there and you're listening to this and and you want to understand the reason why, what would you say? Why should they embrace uh, some of these technologies so they can grow in the future? Well, I think there's, an extrinsic and an intrinsic why. I think intrinsically, we all want to um, make leave an impact on this world. And I think there's no better way to do that than help our respective organizations advance and progress and evolve and perform and grow and sustain for a long period of time, right? So I, I think there's that intrinsic value of personally making an impact and raising the bar. And then there's the extrinsic value of Reducing your company's risk so that you know you're not part of the problem when the next cybersecurity event happens, 
as well as increasing your performance so you can meet objectives and you know get bonuses and all that stuff. I think that's the why. In the intrinsic piece around leaving a lasting impact, I think that's something you can feel proud of for the rest of your career. That's certainly what motivates me, less than the less the bonus and the the financial impact piece. Yeah. I mean, those are nice, but uh, you're right. Making that impact, the understanding the greater purpose uh, is so important. So, Andrew, this, is, this has been phenomenal. Uh, thank you for taking the time with us on Eco Ask Why today and for all the information you unpack for our listeners. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.